Bill Ackman is a multi-billionaire and the founder of Pershing Square, which is a hedge fund with over $10 billion in assets under management. He is a very famous activist investor, whose fund has also outperformed the S&P 500 since its inception. He is also a follower of Warren Buffett, and recently, Bill did an interview on the Lex Friedman podcast. In this interview, Bill discussed many different investing topics, but one topic that I found very interesting was when he discussed his Google position. Bill explains why he is bullish on Google, and why he purchased the stock. Now why I want to cover his reasoning in this video is because the way he analyzes businesses and thinks about valuations is the exact same way I do on my channel, and it is a reflection of Warren Buffett and how he thinks about valuing businesses as well. To be honest, I never really followed Bill Ackman or knew much about his investing style before I listened to this podcast, but as I was listening to it, I was pretty blown away by how similar his investing is to my own. So with that being said, let's dive into the video and start by watching the Lex Friedman podcast and the section where Bill Ackman talks about buying Google and why he did so. You were talking about most, and this kind of remind me of um, Alphabet, parent company. Mm -hmm. Sure. We're made, where's, that's a big position for us. So it's interesting that you uh, think that maybe Alphabet fits some of these characteristics. It's tricky to know with everything that's happening in, in AI, and I'm interviewing Sundar Pichai soon. It's interesting that you think that there's a moat. And it's also interesting to analyze it because the consumer is just a fan of technology. Why is Google still around? Like mm -hmm. they've been, it's not just the search engine, it's doing it all the basics of the business of search really well, but they're doing all these other stuff. So what, what's your analysis of Alphabet? Why are you still positive about it? Sure. So. It's a business we've admired as a firm for, you know, whatever, 15 years, um, but rarely got to a price that we felt we could own it because, again, the expectations were so high and price really matters. And really, the sort of AI scare, I would call it, you know, Microsoft comes out with ChatGPT. Uh, they do an amazing demonstration. People are like this most incredible product. And Google, which had been working on AI even earlier, obviously, the Microsoft, Microsoft was behind in AI. That was really their ChatGPT deal that gave them a kind of a, a market presence. Um, and then Google does this fairly disastrous uh, demonstration of BARD. And the world says, oh my God, Google's fallen behind an AI. AI is the future. Stock gets crushed. Google gets to a price around 15 times earnings, uh, which for a business of this quality is an extremely, extremely low price. And our view on Google, one way to think about it, when a business becomes a verb, that's usually a pretty good sign about the mode around the business. So, you know, you'd open your computer and you open your search and very high percentage of the world starts with a Google, you know, page in a one line uh, where you type in your, your search. You know, the Google advertising search YouTube franchise is one of the most dominant uh, franchises in the world. Very difficult to disrupt. Uh, extremely profitable. Uh, the world is moving from offline advertising to online advertising and that trend I think continues. Why? Because you can actually see whether your ads work. You know, they used to say about advertising, you know, uh, you, you spend a fortune and you just don't know which 50% of it works, but you just sort of spend the money because you know, it, ultimately that's going to bring in the customer. And now with online advertising, you can see with granularity, which dollars I'm spending, you know, when people click on the search term and end up buying something and I pay, you know, the, it's a very high return on investment for the advertiser. And they really dominate that business. Now, AI, of course, is a risk. If all of a sudden people start searching or asking questions of ChatGPT and don't start with the Google search bar, that's a risk to the company. And so our view, based on work we had done and talked to industry experts, is that Google, if anything, had a, a uh, by virtue of the, the investment they've made, the time, the energy that people put into it, we felt their AI capabilities were, if anything, potentially greater than uh, Microsoft ChatGPT and that the market had overreacted. And I, because Google, you know, is a big company, uh, global business, regulators uh, scrutinize it incredibly carefully, they couldn't take some of the same liberties a startup like OpenAI did in releasing a product. And I think Google took a more cautious approach in releasing an early version of Bard in terms of its capabilities. And that let the, mark, the world to believe that uh, they were behind. And we ultimately concluded, if any, they're tied or ahead, and you're paying nothing. Uh, for the, that potential business. And they're going to, and they also have huge advantages by virtue. You think of all the data Google has, like the search data, 
um, all the various app, you know, applications, you know, email and otherwise, uh, and the kind of the Google suite of, of products, it's an incredible data set. So they have more, more training data than pretty much any company in the world. They have incredible engineers, they have enormous financial resources. Uh, so that was kind of the bet. And, um, and we still think it's probably the cheapest of the big seven companies in terms of the price you're paying for the business relative to its current earnings. It also is a business uh, that has a lot of potential for efficiency. You know, sometimes when you have this enormously profitable dominant company, you know, all of the technology companies in the post-March 20 world uh, grew enormously in terms of their teams, and they probably overhired. And so you've seen some, you know, the Facebooks of the world, and now even Google starting to get a little more efficient in terms of their operations. So they paid a low multiple for their, the business. Um, one way to think about the value of the business is the price you pay for the earnings. Or alternatively, what's the yield? If you flip over the price over the earnings, it gives you kind of the yield of the business. So a 15 multiple is about a almost a 7.5% yield. And that earnings yield is growing over time as the business grows. That's a, you know, compared to uh, what, what you can earn lending your money to the government, you know, 4%, that's a very attractive going in yield. And then there's all kinds of what we call optionality in all the various businesses and investments they've made that are losing money. We've got a cloud business that's growing very rapidly, but they're investing basically 100% of the profits from that business and growth. So you're in that earnings number, you're not seeing any earnings from the cloud business. And you know they're one of the top cloud players. So very interesting, generally well-managed uh, company with incredible assets and resources and dominance. Uh, you know, and it has no debt, it's got a ton of cash. And so pretty good story. All right, so these are all of the key points that Bill covered in the podcast, and let's discuss them quickly one by one. The first point that Bill talks about is that price really matters, and he says that he paid a 15 price to earnings ratio for Google, and this was the cheapest the stock got in over a decade. If we take a look right here, we can see that Google's price to earnings ratio got down to about 16.7 near the end of 2022 and at the beginning of 2023 when Bill was acquiring his shares. Now, if we take a look throughout history, we can see that back here in 2012, Google's price to earnings ratio was about 17. And back here during the Great Recession of 2008 and 2009, its price to earnings ratio was also about 17. What this means is that during the tech sell off of 2022, Google's price to earnings ratio actually got down to levels that it hasn't seen since 2008 during the Great Recession and in 2012. So this was a decade low price multiple. And Bill says that he used this as an opportunity to invest in the stock. Now we're going to skip ahead a little bit because near the end of the interview clip that I showed, Bill was talking about the earnings yield of the business. So if we actually go to Google's earnings yield, which is simply just the inverse of the price to earnings ratio, we can see here that at the end of 2022, Google had an earnings yield of about 6%. And as you can see throughout history, this was actually the highest earnings yield that Google shares have ever offered. Now, the reason that I also like to take a look at the yield that stocks can deliver to me as the investor is because when you convert the price ratio into the yield, then you can start comparing the stock investment versus basically any other investment such as bonds. And we actually have the 10 year bond yield right here. And what Bill was saying was that when he was buying Google shares at that six to 7% earnings yield, bonds were yielding about 4% at that same time. Now, what this means is that Bill Ackman was getting a higher earnings yield on cost than he would be getting if he was simply buying a government bond. So at this time, Google was offering investors a higher yield than bonds were. Then Bill also talks about how over time, as Google continues to grow its earnings, then his earnings yield on cost will continue to grow as well and offer an even higher return than what he could get with bonds. Now, why I found this so interesting is because this is exactly what Warren Buffett suggests investors should do. Warren says that investors should always look at the yield the stock offers, then compare it against the risk-free rate, which is a government bond. And what you want is to make sure that the stock has a higher yield than a government bond to make sure that you are being compensated more for taking on the additional risk of owning stocks. In fact, Benjamin Graham, who was Warren Buffett's mentor and came up with the concept of a margin of safety in investing, actually said that the margin of safety principle is simply buying stocks at higher yields than government bonds. The difference between those two yields is your margin of safety. So in my opinion, it is very important to pay attention to the price that you are paying for stocks. 
and the yields that you are ultimately getting on your investments when you purchase them and over the long term as the business continues to grow. But now moving on to the second point, Bill says that he does believe that Google has a moat. First off, I agree with Bill Ackman. And second off, I have some screenshots here that I do believe will show that Google does have a pretty strong moat. So this is the search engine market share worldwide. And we can see that the top line here is Google's search engine market share, which has consistently been around 90% and it's not really going down at all. And by the way, this is all the way back to January of 2009. So over the past 15 years, Google has maintained a roughly 90% market share worldwide for search engines. And this is very interesting to me because in 2022 and kind of into 2023, people were saying that Bing and ChatGPT were going to completely destroy Google's market share and that Bing was going to steal a large portion of Google's market share. However, when you take a look at the actual data, Google's search market share is still well on top and it's not really going down. It's still hovering around that 90% average that it has maintained over the past 15 years. So to me, this kind of suggests that Google does have a very strong moat and that Bing is not successfully attacking Google's business quite yet. Additionally, if we take a look at the operating system market share worldwide, we can see that Android is sitting at number one with over 40% market share now. Windows is actually trending down and it's sitting at about 30, just below 30% market share now. So Google's market share with Android, by the way, Google does own Android. So Google's market share with Android is actually uptrending, whereas Windows or Microsoft has been trending down over the past 15 years now. So I do think that this is another indication that Google has multiple moats. Their Android business seems to have a very strong moat as it is taking market share and maintaining that market share from its competitors in the overall operating system space worldwide. Lastly, we are going to take a look at the different browser market shares worldwide. And here we can see that Google Chrome has been massively taking market share over the past 15 years. It basically started at 0% all the way back in 2009, and it has been uptrending and now kind of flattening out around 65%. And it's not even close. The next one is Safari sitting at about 15%. So Google Chrome also has a massive market dominance for search engines. <laughs> So Google Chrome also has a massive market dominance for browser market share worldwide, which suggests that this is another product that Google owns that has a very strong and durable moat, and it's not really being attacked successfully by its competitors. Google also now has nine apps with over 1 billion users. These apps are Google Photos, Google Maps, Gmail, YouTube, Google Play Store, Android, Google Workspace, and the Chrome browser. In fact, five of these products now have over 2 billion active users worldwide, and two of them have over 3 billion users worldwide. So Google has a massive network of products that are used by billions and billions of people around the world. And this is kind of what Bill Ackman was talking about as well, because Google has billions of users on multiple different products, and they are getting all of the data from these users that they can then use to power their products, their artificial intelligence, etc. So Google has this massive data moat as well that I do believe that they are going to continue leveraging as they continue building out their AI capabilities, and it seems like Bill Ackman agrees. Then Bill says that the world is moving to online advertising, and I completely agree. So right here I have the chart of the digital advertising spending worldwide from 2021 to 2027. And here we can see that in 2023, online advertising spend was at $602 billion if we round up. Now in 2024, it's projected to grow by another 10% to $667 billion, and by 2027, it's projected to grow to $870 billion worldwide. So online advertising is a market that is growing by around 10% annually worldwide, and it doesn't look like it is going to stop anytime soon. Now, the reason that online advertising is growing so much and is so effective is because advertisers can actually see the return on investment for every single ad that they put out. For example, over at Stock Unlock, we do do some YouTube ads, and we can see exactly how many clicks we're getting on these ads versus how much we're spending, and then we can decide if we want to continue going with one ad or put more money into another ad, and we can immediately see the ROI or return on investment of every single dollar we're spending. You can't really do this outside of digital ads. So this is why digital ads have been taking off so much, because advertisers can actually know if their money is being spent well and overall become more efficient and effective with their advertising. Now, what's also interesting is Google has around 39% of the global digital advertising revenues, and they have the number one market share, followed by Facebook with around 18%, and then Amazon with around 7%. So this is another market that Google is dominating, and as the overall global online advertising spend continues to grow over the long term, I do believe that Google is going to continue benefiting from that.
Then Bill Ackman does say that AI is a risk to Google. But Bill talked to industry experts and they basically said that Google AI is better or at least on par with Microsoft. And back in 2022 and 2023, the market was overreacting after Google released their BARD and it was pretty much a massive flop compared to Microsoft's ChatGPT. However, Google is a massive company that did not really want to take risks, especially when they are already under so much regulatory scrutiny. But OpenAI, which is basically owned by Microsoft now, OpenAI is a smaller startup that is able to take these larger risks. So they moved a little bit faster and took those risks with ChatGPT, and then Google was kind of just moving slower with BARD, so it looked like OpenAI and Microsoft were ahead of Google, but Google was actually just being a little bit more restrictive. And overall, the industry experts did say that Google's AI is probably better than what OpenAI and Microsoft could do. So again, he believed that the market was overreacting. Then Bill moves on to say that Google is the cheapest out of the Magnificent Seven. So here I have a screenshot from Stock Unlock comparing the price to free cash flow of Google against all of the other Magnificent Seven stocks. Here we can see that Google's price to free cash flow is sitting at 28.3 right now, and the only other stock with a lower price ratio is Apple. So maybe someone can make the argument that Apple is actually a cheaper business on a price to free cash flow basis than Google right now. However, when we take a look at all of the different Magnificent Seven companies revenue growth, we can see that Apple's revenue has been flat for almost two years now and is actually in a slight dip. Whereas Google's revenue is still continuing to grow, it's sitting at all time highs and the revenue has grown by about 11% year over year now. And I do think that growth should be factored in to a business's price. So the fact that Apple is selling for a 25 price to free cash flow, but its revenues are actually declining right now, whereas Google is selling for a 28 price to free cash flow at the same time as its revenue is growing almost in line with all of the other Magnificent Seven businesses, kind of suggests that Google is actually the cheapest business in the group, at least when you're taking a look at the price to free cash flow metric. Now, in my own opinion, I actually do believe that Amazon is a cheaper business than Google right now. And I do use the price to operating cash flow for Amazon. I have discussed this on my channel before. But Amazon is actually selling near its historical low price to operating cash flow ratio. And for that reason, I actually do believe that Amazon is the cheapest Magnificent Seven stock today. So this is one where I actually do not agree with Bill Ackman, but I do see his reasoning and his logic here. And it is pretty sound. And the argument could be made that Google could be cheaper than Amazon too. Now, the last point that we need to discuss is Bill says that Google has a lot of potential for efficiency. And Bill actually said something in this interview that I found very interesting. He said that Google Cloud is currently not being factored in to Google's profitability or price ratios at all. So when we're taking a look at Google's price to free cash flow or its price to earnings, we're not seeing Google Cloud factored in there at all right now because the business is currently losing money because it's reinvesting all of its profits back into growth. Its operating margin just became positive over the past couple of quarters. And in the fourth quarter, I believe it produced around $860 million of operating income, but operating income is not free cash flow or net income. So even though Google Cloud's operating income is now positive, it's probably still not showing up on the overall bottom line. However, I do believe that the cloud business, Google Cloud, can become a massively profitable business in the future. For example, AWS has a 30% operating margin, which is significantly higher than Google's basically 0% operating margin right now. If we apply this 30% operating margin to Google Cloud's annualized revenue, then we get about $11 billion in annual operating income that could be added to Google's overall operating income. Google's overall business in the trailing 12 months produced about $88 billion in total operating income. So if Google wanted to focus on efficiency and actually make its Google Cloud profitable and achieve those same margins as AWS, then this could add around 15% overall to Google's operating income. And this is also a business that is growing by 26% annually. So overall, I do believe that one day Google Cloud will become a very efficient and profitable business for Google overall. But right now, the business is just reinvesting everything into growth and trying to capture as much growth as possible. But long term, this probably will be a cash flow machine adding to Google's bottom line, and that's not really factored into today's price at all. Additionally, Bill Ackman talks about how Google kind of became this big fat company when it was expanding and trying to capture growth. Now, there are different market cycles that I have noticed in my own investing. When the market is going good and the economy is going good as well, what investors typically want to see is revenue growth. They don't, they don't really care as much about profit growth profit margins or efficiency. So when we're in these bull markets, I do find that businesses tend to spend a lot of money to try and capture as much growth as possible. This kind of causes them to overhire maybe 
they have their staff be a little bit too high. And again, they're not really focused on producing the highest ROIC or return on their invested capital. However, when we start to enter an economic slowdown or go through a recession, what investors start to shift their focus towards or what they care about is the profitability of the business. They want to see free cash flow growing, net income growing, and overall margins expanding. This is exactly what I believe is happening to Google right now. And I do believe that the business is going to continue becoming more profitable and efficient and increasing its margins over the next year or so. And here's why. So back in 2005, Google had a free cash flow margin of about 28%. Then we can see that as the economy was hot and expanding, the free cash flow margin got down to about 15% by the first quarter of 2007. Then during the Great Recession, Google said, hey, we're going to focus back on efficiency and we're going to focus back on getting our business as efficient as possible and boosting our margins as much as possible as well. Then we can see that throughout the Great Recession and by the end of the Great Recession here at the end of 2009, Google got its free cash flow margin all the way back up to 36%. So during the Great Recession, the company's free cash flow margin more than doubled. And this is what I think is going to happen again to Google's business. Now, I don't think their free cash flow margin is going to get back up to 36%. But we can see that recently the free cash flow margin has been uptrending from its low here in 2020. So Google is clearly trying to become a more profitable business once again and get its margins back up. And when we do take a look at Google's history of expanding its margins during economic slowdowns, I do think the business is going to be successful doing this once again and getting its profitability back up. So I do think there is a lot of room for efficiency over at Google. And with that being said, I do believe we covered all of the key points that Bill Ackman talked about in this interview. And overall, I do think that this was a fantastic interview from Bill Ackman over on the Lex Friedman podcast. If you have not watched it yet, I would strongly recommend doing so. And also, there is a lot more golden nuggets sprinkled throughout this interview that I would be happy to cover on my channel. So let me know down in the comment section below if you enjoyed this video and if you want to see another one just like this with Bill Ackman discussing more of the golden nuggets that he discussed throughout that interview. Lastly, if you did enjoy this video or you found it helpful in some way, then please remember to leave a like on it as I really do appreciate it and it really helps out the channel. And if you are new here and you wanna stick around and see more content, please remember to subscribe because that helps out as well. But with all that being said, thank you all so much for watching. I truly do appreciate it and I really hope to see you all again in my next video.